No. <laughs> Hi, good evening, yeah. everyone. Well, welcome to Turner Free Library. My name is Shannon Bowman Sarkeesian, and I'm your outreach librarian. Um, first, I wanted to thank the friends of the Turner Free Library. This is a friend sponsored event, so without them, we would not be able to bring programs like this to the community. Um, I have some flyers for upcoming events uh, on the table over there. There are also uh, disposable masks if you would prefer uh, to grab one. Um, so I am thrilled and honored to welcome the Chronicles Ted Reinstein tonight, um, who is here to talk about his new book. And I'm just going to go ahead and uh, get out of the way <laughs> so that we can hear from Ted. So thank you so much for being here and uh, for welcoming Ted with me. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you all for coming out. Uh, I'm just going to take this off while I'm talking. I am fully vaxxed, boosted. I would walk around with a Pfizer IV drip. <laughs> but um, I will keep my distance, and when I'm back over here at the end, when, uh, if anybody wants any books, I will have my mask back on. So um, thank you. And as I have gotten in the habit lately, uh, saying double thank you. Uh, because uh, not only am I appreciative that you're coming out tonight to hear me talk about my new book, but I'm also appreciative as a devoted, passionate fan of public libraries like the Turner Free. Um, it takes an extra effort these days. It always took a little extra effort to come to an event at a library. It takes a little extra effort now, right? Mentally, psychologically. You gotta wear a damn mask. <laughs> so uh, I appreciate that too, as I know the library does. So thank you, thank you for coming out. It's appreciated. So uh, as Shannon said, I'm going to talk to you tonight about um, my my newest book, uh, my fourth book, and this one is a departure in some ways. My my earlier books. How many of you have been at one of my earlier talks here, which now goes back I think five years? Mm -hmm. So I'm not surprised. Uh, if there aren't that many, and uh, uh, it's not enough. But um, but the truth of the matter is, um, this is a little bit of a of a departure. Uh, my other books uh, have all to this point been uh, kind of New England centric, mm -hmm. and so this one is not. This one is a different love, a different passion, baseball, and uh, and civil rights for that matter. So. I'm just going to jump in. You'll see a few times I'll go back and forth from the book. The talk will be going throughout. Um, I'll be doing both. Um, and I think you'll keep right up. As you turn right off of Boston's busy Commonwealth Avenue and proceeded past the main buildings of Boston University, not a single person would have guessed where the short, slightly stooped pedestrian with an armload of papers was headed. After all, it was 1938, and what possible business would a black man have with the white, well-known owner of a Major League Baseball team? But the bespectacled young man was, in fact, headed to Braves Field. And there to meet in the executive offices with the co-owner and president of the Boston Braves, Bob Quinn. It's hard to imagine a meeting of more striking contrasts. The two participants themselves were as different as night and day, their backgrounds of entirely other worlds. One man's father had been an immigrant stonecutter from Ireland. The other man's father had been born into slavery. Having never met, they shared little more than the air they breathed. But there was baseball and barriers, and on this day, a rare and extraordinary opportunity and Mabry Counts was determined to take full advantage. So there's a reason why I start the book and end the book, literally the, the preface and the epilogue with Mabry Counts, Doc Counts, as he was known. Grew up not too far from here. What, I don't know, maybe 45 minutes in West Medford? And in some ways, the reason why I like to start the book and end the book is that Doc Counts, who I did not know, I don't know if any of you had ever heard of him, I had never heard of him before I started researching the book, and I always prefer to, if I haven't heard of something no one else has either. It's just my own perspective. But <laughs> he's really the quintessential unsung hero. He really typifies not so much everybody in this story, as you'll see, some of these unsung heroes are, are some of them are a little more sung, right? They, some of them are well known. 
But most of the unsung heroes, as you'll see, were more like Doc Counts in that they were not famous, they were not celebrities, they were not wealthy, they had no real power, they had no political standing, they had no real social standing. So how did they ever in the world succeed in overturning something that was a pillar at the time they overturned it of Major League Baseball, one of the country's just rock solid preeminent institutions? They only did it by coming together. And they often were working entirely on their own. There weren't marches in the streets. This is pre-civil rights of the 60s, right? They only did it. They only found that they had power. A person like Doc Counts, who lived in his own really little world in West Medford, was a writer, gifted sports writer for black publications. They only found that they had power by coming together, by beginning to act in unison. And that's what had brought Doc Counts to Braves Field on this day. He had succeeded in doing something that nobody else, no one else, had succeeded in doing by 1938. He met with the owner of a Major League Baseball team. And he made the case that even though the Braves and other Major League teams at that time, which they were doing, were allowing black baseball teams, professional teams, often Negro League teams, to play at their Major League parks when that, team's, when that city's team was on the road, that's not what he was there to talk about. Quinn thought maybe it was, but it wasn't. He was interested in talking about having black players play on the Braves when the Braves were home. He was talking about having black players play on the Braves. He was talking about having black players play on the Braves and every other of, at that time, the 16 Major League teams. And the point that he really wanted to make with Bob Quinn who he respected as a lifelong man of baseball. And obviously by meeting with Counts, somewhat of a progressive man in baseball, given the time, 1938. The Red Sox general manager didn't agree to meet with him, but Bob Quinn did. But what Doc Counts really wanted to make clear was that he was talking not so much about integrating baseball, but that as he was sure Bob Quinn might know, he was talking about reintegrating baseball. That that had already happened once before. Which is why I, I, I like to start with a, a question because um, it goes right to the heart of, of, of what I'm talking about and what Doc House was talking about. Anybody know who the second Major League black baseball player was after Jackie Robinson broke the color barrier in 1947. You sure? Uh, I think so. Larry Doby? Larry Doby is a very good choice. It is one that people often go with, mm -hmm. but it's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Larry Doby certainly was. Larry Doby, as this wise man of baseball history knows, Not so well. played for the Cleveland Indians and was the first American League black player, and won Rookie of the Year in his first year with the Cleveland Indians. But it was not Larry Doby. The second person to break the color barrier when Jackie Robinson broke it in 1947 was Jackie Robinson. Trick question. Trick question, <laughs> indeed, was Jackie Robinson. The first, the first black major league player came 60 years earlier, Moses Fleetwood Walker. That's who Doc Counts wanted to make sure that Braves owner Bob Quinn knew they were talking about. As he put it in his discussion, he said, he turned to Bob Quinn and he said, Mr. Quinn is a lifelong learned man of baseball. Surely you are familiar with Moses Fleetwood Walker. Most people are not. I wasn't. I wasn't. But he was the first major league black baseball player. And there were 60 years in between Moses Fleetwood Walker and Jackie Robinson. Now here's the thing, baseball was an outlier in its early days. It really was. It really was. You know, the term national pastime is coined in that period of the 1870s, which is only a decade after the end of the Civil War, when the country, as we all know, had nearly torn itself apart, literally. And the national pastime is coined, that phrase is coined, to describe something that the country had never known before. So this is a period of time when national 
professional hockey doesn't exist. Professional basketball is literally just being invented. Professional football doesn't exist. Professional soccer doesn't exist in America. Baseball is entirely unique. We're, we're, we're spoiled with all the major league sports today. You name it. You can find a major league, I'm sure, for Pinochle if you look for it. But this was entirely unique. This was all of a sudden the sport of baseball was mushrooming all over the country, and many people saw that as this sort of wonderfully encouraging sign because it grew fastest in the South. That this was an encouraging sign that the country that had just been torn apart was finding through a sport, this sport of baseball, to somehow bring itself back together. A south, a bone, if you will, the national pastime. And they found it additionally encouraging that unlike the rest of America at this time, it actually looks a little bit like America. It's not all white. Baseball was unique in its early days, that it was an institution in baseball, professional baseball as a group, was actually integrated. There were usually, I mean the teams were almost entirely all white, and there were never more than one or two one instance, three black players on a professional baseball team. But just the same, it wasn't, that wasn't the case in most other respects in America. But Fowler, who we're going to talk about more in a few minutes, distinguishes his, himself as not just one of the early stars of black baseball, but probably heralded as the single most impassioned baseball player of early baseball. Nobody seemed to live and breathe to play baseball like Bud Fowler which was also what is going to make his story so heartbreaking. Frank Grant, first black professional ball player from Massachusetts, the Berkshires, and the Walker brothers. Most famous of all, most significant of all, Moses Fleetwood sitting right here, his younger brother Weldy right here, and they were teammates for a brief period in the early 1880s at Oberlin College in Oberlin, Ohio. Moses Fleetwood Walker, not only the first true star black ball player, but transforms the entire position. So I said this is the period of time when the, the phrase national pastime is coined. It's also the period of time when the phrase backstop you've heard is coined, right? So backstop to describe a catcher. You know, today it's one of those old terms that, that needs explaining to most people because we think of a backstop as a physical thing, right? The physical thing in baseball's early days was the catcher. And it was where you would stick your most untalented player. They had one job, right? You'd say, you know, Jimmy, you have one job. Stop the damn baseball from rolling off the field and delaying the game, right? Moses Fleetwood Walker changed that. He's the first player to incorporate shin guards, first player to incorporate a face mask, first player to incorporate a chest protector, first player to call pitches, direct the pitcher, right? So he's directing the game like catchers do today. Right? Direct line between Moses Fleetwood Walker and every catcher right up to the present day. And first catcher ever to throw a runner out attempting to steal a base. It had always been legal. It had just never, there had just never been a catcher who was talented enough to throw a runner out. Which I've always wondered just how shocked that base runner must have been. Right? He made him out. He threw it? Wait, what? But he was. He was. And he was terrific. He was what we would call today a five-tool player, right? He could do it all. He could run, he could hit, he could throw, he could catch. He was great. Good enough that the, the Toledo, Ohio Blue Stockings in 1884 signed Moses Fleetwood Walker to a major league contract, making Moses Fleetwood Walker the first black major league player. He starts the season with the Blue Stockings and they open up the season against the Chicago Cubs which was terrific because not only did you have the headline news of the first black major league player squaring off against the marquee baseball team of early major league baseball, the Cubs. There was nothing like them. They were like the Yankees of their time. So a lot of people thought, mind you, 1884, he breaks camp with them in 1884. This is just 20 years, 20 years, basically, since the end of the Civil War and emancipation. So it was easy for a lot of people to feel that this is a promising thing. This is an encouraging thing about America re-knitting itself together. Not everybody felt that way. 
and starting with the team the Blue Stockings played that day with Moses Fleetwood Walker. Because Cap Ants, Adrian Constantin, better known as Cap, captain of the Chicago Cubs, felt differently. Cap Anson, if Moses Fleetwood Walker was the first starring black player of that early era, Cap Anson was, without any question, the first bona fide superstar of early baseball. He really was. He was the first bona fide slugger, another term that was coined to describe Cap Anson. This is the, you've heard the phrase, I'm sure, over the years, the, the dead ball era. So that denotes the fact that baseballs at this time were not wound by machine, they were wound by hand. Today they're wound so tight you can literally bounce a baseball, but that was not the case. They were much looser, they did not go as far. So if you hit 29 home runs on multiple occasions like Cap Anson did, that would be like 79 to 89 home runs today. So he was seen as this incredible slug, and he was. He still holds to this very day two or three Chicago Cubs batting records. That's amazing from the dead ball era through today and all the players that the Cubs have ever had, including people like Ron Santo and Ernie Banks, real terrific ball players, cap ins. So all of that is his due. All of that is valid and is a part of Cap Anson's record. Also part of his record is the fact that he was an unrepentant racist, he was a vicious bully with a really foul mouth. None of which is on his plaque in Cooperstown, surprisingly enough. Um, Cap Anson did not like the fact that they were playing on opening day against a team that fielded a black ball player. He played the game under protest, and he filed a complaint with Major League Baseball, and he said the Cubs would no longer take the field against any team that fielded a black ball player. He used a different word, as you can imagine. And so Major League owners had to take this threat very seriously. The, the, the Cubs are the marquee team of the era, playing constantly. And they had to take that threat very seriously and decide what to do about it. So in the summer of 1887, they did decide what to do about it. They would please Cap Anson. And they entered into a gentleman's agreement, which is always, anytime you have a gentleman's agreement, and they are always in history the ones that matter, between men. Uh, anytime you have a gentleman's agreement, it is a telltale sign that someone's got something to hide. Otherwise, why not take a vote? Otherwise, why not record the vote? Otherwise, why not write down names? Otherwise, why not come before the press when you've made this big move and explain why you've done it? Take the heat or take the praise? A gentleman's agreement is a universal mark of a coward. And gentleman's agreements, in this case, it affected black ball players. Gentlemen's agreements have been entered into in all kinds of institutions, from politics to business to education, you name it, including sports. And they have barred women, they have barred Jews, they have barred Hispanics, they have barred the disabled, they have barred gays, you name it. That's what gentlemen's agreements are about. They're about doing something that you know you'll take heat for, so there's no record. And there is no record. And technically, you can know who the owners were, but there was no record of who voted. If, if in fact it was unanimous, we'll never know. But it stood. And at this point, thereafter, from July 1887, black ball players were barred from signing any major or minor league contracts. Those that were currently under contract, like Moses Fleetwood Walker, were allowed to play out their contract, and there would be no more. The color barrier was now a thing in Major League Baseball, and I said that it makes, in some ways, Bud Fowler's story heartbreaking. You know, there's many stories in this whole narrative of breaking the color barrier that are poignant. Um, Bud Fowler's is one of a couple that I would describe as heartbreaking. Because, as I mentioned, this is a man who people see as basically living to play baseball. He plays pretty much, it's his entire life. It's his entire life. He played. He'd play every day of the year if he could have. He literally traveled the north and southern hemisphere, depending on the time of year it was, that he could hook on with a team that was playing throughout the year. And now he finds himself unable to follow his passion. He died of a blood disorder in Frankfurt, New York in 1913. He was only 55. His unmarked grave told not a word of a truly extraordinary life. 
For years since the color barrier began to spread in 1887, Fowler had relentlessly fought for a place in organized baseball. Along with the other early black professional players, he had continued to try to play in the shadow of the descending barrier as teams shed black ball players and refused to sign more. Fowler had uncommon talent, there's no question. But often it seemed that his greatest skill was in seeming to just somehow doggedly outrun the inescapable end. As if he simply willed himself to persevere, to compete, and play, and even excel in an increasingly hostile landscape that move about as he might, was now expelling him at shorter and shorter intervals. In Michigan in 1895, Bud Fowler was out of options. They're home, but he had outlasted virtually all of the others. My skin is against me, Fowler wrote in 1895. If I had just not been quite so black, I might have been able to catch on as a Spaniard or something of that kind. The race prejudice is so strong, my black skin just bars me. Now, as the 20th century unfolded, it barred them all. The color barrier was complete. It would take another 50 years of fierce Fowler-like will and determination to break through again. So, now I mentioned at the outset that baseball was a little bit different. Baseball was an outlier. Baseball was somewhat integrated when most of America was not. Now, baseball is like everything else. Baseball is completely integrated, and virtually all of America is now segregated, I meant to say. All of America. This is Jim Crow. This is the period of Plessy versus Ferguson, right? Which barred blacks from, from riding in a white conveyance of any kind. It is going to be seen 75, 100 years later in a poll about 20 years ago by the American jurists that uh, it was uh, voted the single worst Supreme Court decision of all time. It literally legalized state-sanctioned segregation. So baseball is now just like everything else in America. It's segregated. Um, and yet there are terrific black ball players that could be playing in the major leagues if the major leagues would let them play. But what to do with the fact that there was no longer any kind, there was not even, you know, now that they, the, the major leagues are closed off, what do really gifted black ball players do who feel that they are entitled to play at an elite level? I mean, think about how frustrating that would be. Not just in sports, think about how frustrating that would be as a musician. If someone tells you, you are the greatest violinist, I swear to God, I have ever heard. But you won't be, ever be able to play at Carnegie Hall. Think that's how black ball players felt. That's how they felt. No one felt that more than Root Foster. Root Foster was a gifted black pitcher. Fierce guy, physically. He, weighed, he was about 6'3", weighed about 245 pounds. Um, and when he retired, he was determined to do something about the fact that gifted ball players like him and those that were younger and on their way up and maybe be you know, better than him, they needed some sort of an elite level of play. And he understood that given segregation that blacks would not be able to play Major League Baseball. But he wanted to see if there was some league that could be created that would allow blacks to be showcased at an elite level of play. And his idea was for a Negro Leagues. Root Foster, understandably then, is seen as the father of black baseball, he's often called. He is the father of the Negro Leagues. The Negro Leagues, he told those who might be interested in joining, would be the ship. Everything else out there is the sea. And it, it won the day. He worked tirelessly at it, so tirelessly it drove him eventually to a nervous breakdown, but he succeeded in creating the Negro Leagues in the winter of 1920 in Kansas City, Missouri. The Negro Leagues are born, thanks to Root Foster. And what draw your attention? This man right here, J.L. Wilkinson. He is the only owner at the inception, the only white owner of a Negro League team at the league's inception. He will be the only white owner in the entire history of the Negro Leagues, all the way through it's dissipating in the late 60s, J.L. Wilkinson. Now, I don't bring him up as just a mere you know, ethnic oddity. Uh, I bring him up because there is a direct line on J.L. Wilkinson, from J.L. Wilkin, Wilkinson on the day that the Negro Leagues are founded to Jackie Robinson breaking the color barrier because J.L. Wilkinson will be the Negro League owner who signs Jackie Robinson to his first 
baseball, professional baseball contract. So the Negro Leagues are born, and Ruth Foster was a prophet because immediately the Negro Leagues take off. There is all this pent-up demand, particularly in the black communities, for the most gifted players to play at a more elite level, and now players like Pops Lloyd, Judy Johnson, Oscar Charleston, probably one of the half dozen best shortstops to ever ever play baseball, are now being able to showcase their talents. Not so much to blacks. Blacks knew how good these players were. It was the Negro Leagues are the most significant unsung hero in the entire drive to break the color barrier because they created the showcase for whites to see gifted black ball players play. The knock about black ball players was the same knock against African Americans in any other field of endeavor. Whether a physician or a first baseman. Not as good. Can't do it. The Negro Leagues were critical to show that they could. To show that they could. Cool Papa Bell, generally regarded today universally as the fastest human being to have ever played baseball. How fast was he? I have no idea. But I'm told, pretty fast. He was called the human blur. Um, my, my favorite anecdote about how fast Cool Papa Bell was came from his longtime friend, lifelong friend, roommate, teammate, legend in his own right, Satchel Page. Now, I say this advisedly because Satchel Page was also famous for exaggerating, <laughs> starting with his age. <laughs> but uh, nonetheless, I do like his. He was once asked, he was once asked, Satchel Page was once asked, just how fast was Cool Papa Bell? He said, Cool Papa? He said, forget what he did on the diamond. Fastest move I ever saw him make was in a hotel room. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> they, were, they were rooming together. So he said, we were in St. Louis, and uh, I was already in bed. Satchel was fixing to get into bed, and I said, cool, Papa, hit the lights, would you, before you get into bed? He said, he hit the light switch? The room was dark before he was under the covers. <laughs> now, the Negro Leagues take off. Rube Foster was indeed a prophet. The Negro Leagues mushroomed. Every sizable black community wants to create a Negro League team. They go from 13 teams at, at its inception, 25 to 30. Everywhere, everywhere the Negro Leagues are catching on and they're just explosive growth. They divide into a Negro National League, a Negro American League, a first Negro World Series. And it just seems like the growth of the Negro Leagues will never stop, but it did stop. In fact, by the end of their first decade, all growth of all kind stopped in America with the Great Depression. You know, I think we sometimes forget how cataclysmic the Great Depression was. Maybe some of you had relatives or parents who grew up during the Depression, and you grew up with stories like I did. My, uh, my dad was uh, 10, 11 years old in the worst early years of the Depression, 30, 31, 32, 33. But you know, when you look at the numbers today, it really, really still can't fail to shock, right? So generally, unemployment, a quarter of all Americans, right? A quarter of all Americans are out of work. That is completely flipped in many minority communities, where only a quarter were working, right? So there's no mystery in that, because the period of the growth of the Negro Leagues is also the period of what's called the Great Migration, right? So it was the period of the greatest exodus of blacks from the south to northern cities, all during the, the, the late 1880s, 90s, the teens, the 20s, the 30s. And they were leaving the south to find better jobs, better paying jobs, better working conditions, better quality of life for themselves and their children. And the good news is they found it. They found it in cities clear across the northern belt, from Denver to Cleveland to Chicago to Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, you name it, they found it. That's the good news. The bad news is that when the depression hit and workers were being laid off, what happens? Last hired, first fired. So black unemployment in places like Atlanta, Pittsburgh, Philadelphia was over 70%. In the worst years of the depression, 30, 31, 32, 33, over 30,000 businesses were going under every single year, including the Negro Leagues. Gone. Gone. Hey, look. If you're trying to cobble together a few bucks to cover the mortgage or pay the rent or put some food in front of your children, you're not buying ball game tickets, right? 
and the only thing that kept Negro League teams going were ticket sales and sometimes slender lines of credit from the few black banks, black old banks, that were in some of the larger cities. But the black banks went under. So they went under. Gone. Now, you might wonder, look, every, all, all 16 of the major league teams at that time, every single one of them was in itself, right? Was a, was a thriving business. So how many major league teams went out of business? No, they, they were lucky all to be cushioned. They were, they were cushioned from the worst effects of the Depression, largely because every single major league team at this time, in the 30s, every single team, you know, today you have some major league teams in all the sports that are, you know, consortiums of business interests and so forth. Not the case then. Every single team was owned by a wealthy owner, like our Red Sox, Tom Yonke. I don't know if you remember what you got for your 16th birthday, but Tom Yonke came into $16.3 million. And five years later, he came into another $30 million. So they were cushioned. They were cushioned. They were, interestingly, Tom Yonke was a relative pauper in comparison to some of his colleagues, fellow owners in Major League Baseball. I mentioned the Chicago Cubs before. Chicago Cubs were owned by a guy named Phil Ridley. Phil Ridley made a little chewing gum. Did very well. The St. Louis Cardinals, for instance, were owned by Augustus Bush. He brewed a little beer. They were fabulously more wealthy than Tom Yawkey. So they were cushioned. They were cushioned. But the Negro Leagues went under, except for one team. Now, I know I mentioned J.L. Wilkinson earlier. You're going to see that he keeps popping up. Because J.L. Wilkinson was a remarkable person. He really was. He was to many black ball players that played for him, including the legendary Buck O'Neill, who some of you may remember from Ken Burns' baseball documentary, right? Buck O'Neill has this wonderful, which I discuss in the book, he has this wonderful story that he shares about signing with the, with the Monarchs and an owner, Jan Wilkinson, sitting next to him one day. He realized that, that he was sitting next to him in the locker room. And he said, uh, Buck, I understand you're having a hard time finding a place to live. I want to be with you. And uh, we'll find a place tomorrow. I don't want you to go another day without me. And Buck O'Neill was like, who the is this guy? <laughs> he said, and the way he described it is, he said, I kept looking at his skin. He was white. You know, and he was like, he was the first white person in Buck O'Neill's entire life he said, who seemed to speak to him as if there was no, there, there was no barrier. Like, like he would hear J.L. Wilkinson talk to his own sons, and he said it sounded the same. And he couldn't, he couldn't fathom that. That was J.L. Wilkinson. J.L. Wilkinson was the only owner and the only New League team that did not disband in the wake of the Depression. He was determined to keep the team together and not let anybody Lay, lay anybody off. And in that way, you know he reminds me of, and it's interesting because this fellow just died two months ago. Anybody remember Aaron Feuerstein? Malden Mills? Right? So when the Malden Mills burned in Lawrence in 1992, you probably remember, Aaron Feuerstein did an extraordinary thing. He kept paying all of his workers. Even though they had no job and they had no place to go work. He employed, kept all of his workers employed while they rebuilt the mill. This is sort of like Joe Wilkinson. And the only way he could do it was to barnstorm and play baseball literally, practically, with, with few exceptions, literally 365 days a year. Again, like Bud Fowler, completely making this huge circuit of the northern and southern hemisphere so that they could play during the fall and the winter and come back into the northern hemisphere in the spring and the summer. And they literally played off in three, four, five games a day. And they would travel, here they are barnstorming across Canada, in Dr. Yak, which was a bus that he had outfitted for the team. And I don't know two mysteries about Dr. Yak to me, which I, well, one of them I had solved recently. One of the mysteries is, nobody seems to know how it got its nickname, Dr. Yak. But the other one is, I'm looking at this picture, mind you, it's not like bus number two and three and four are lined up behind. That's it. That's the bus. These guys are not diminutive. 
Hmm. Right? And they're all on the same bus. So how they do it. So recently a guy came up to me at a book talk about a month ago and he said, I can tell you how they did that. Which makes perfect sense because I knew that GL had outfitted the bus, custom outfitted the bus for this team. Partly so that the seats would tilt back and people could get a little bit of shut eye, not all together at the same time. But also he outfitted it with a small refrigerator and a small stove. Because he knew that while he would be able to stay in any hotel and eat at any restaurant as they traveled around, his players would not. So he also apparently, according to this guy who, who solved the mystery, he also outfitted this thing with these two wing-like running boards that came out from underneath the bus. And yeah, so five or six or seven guys on each side of the bus would be standing on the running board for like 50 or 60 miles until they would switch, right? So that's how he did it. But he couldn't do it forever. He couldn't do this forever. It was a wonderful gesture, but they couldn't, you couldn't keep this up forever. They kept it up for about a year, and they couldn't keep it up. And at that point, the monarchs would have been forced to disband as well. And there's only one reason they didn't disband, because the Negro Leagues were reborn, almost magically. And the Negro Leagues were reborn because of Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh is the only sort of, it's the only city that is an unsung hero. And I always say without Pittsburgh, in the early 1930s, there would not have been Brooklyn in the mid-1940s. They may have been Brooklyn later on, because without Pittsburgh, you would not have had the rebirth of the Negro Leagues. And without the Negro Leagues, you don't break the color barrier. There would have had to have been some showcase for star black ball players to convince enough whites to break the color barrier. And the Negro Leagues were that showcase. And they were reborn in Pittsburgh because of these two remarkable men. You know, I started to talk by talking about that study in contrast between Doc House and Bob Quinn of the Braves. This is a far more, a far more dramatic study in contrast. Now, you might think, well, where's the contrast, right? I mean, the two men, the two guys who seem to like baseball, the two guys in Pittsburgh, they're both black. That's where it all ends. That's all they had in common. They hated each other. They hated each other. I always like to compare it to, you know, people of a certain age, like me and you, Doug. Uh, people of a certain age will probably remember, remember Mad Magazine? Remember, right, right. So Mad Magazine had a long-running feature called Spy versus Spy, right? And these two spies, right, were, that's all they were about, was like trying to screw the other one and kill the other one, right? They, weren't, they never tried to kill each other, but they did constantly try to screw each other, if you'll pardon my French. And they often succeeded, which they loved. So, but they cooperated on one single thing. They only cooperated on one single thing in their entire professional careers. The need to bring back the Negro Leagues. And that was the most important thing they could have ever cooperated on. Everything else was rivalry their entire life. Cumberland Posey actually grew up in relative affluence in the hill section of Pittsburgh, the black community of Pittsburgh. His father was a celebrated civil engineer, an incredible black success story for the time. Very successful businessman. I'm sure he had hoped that his, his son, Cum Posey, would have um, followed in his father's footsteps. But Cum Posey was a sports nut. Basketball, which was a relatively new sport, and baseball. Baseball won out, and Cumberland Posey was approached in the late 19. Uh, 20s that about saving the baseball team. Forget the Negro Leagues, they were the, but there was a baseball team that had played in the Negro Leagues, the Homestead Grays. Homestead is a section just outside of Pittsburgh. They had a wonderful team for a while called the Homestead Grays. And they were going to go under if somebody wasn't going to buy them. And Cumberland Posey agreed to buy the team and manage it and coach it and general manage it and promote it. He seemed to do a pretty good job. How good? That's the first season Cumberland Posey Jr. took over. Now, let me put this in perspective. So, so this edition of the Homestead Grays, 1931, is generally regarded as possibly the greatest baseball team in history. Black, white, pink, you name it. They won 143 games. Let me put that in perspective. So at this time, Major League Baseball didn't play 162. They played 154 games. The Grays themselves 
won 143 games. So this is absolutely extraordinary. However, not to be outdone, <laughs> Gus Greenland, completely different background, completely different life trajectory. Right? So Gus Greenlee goes up to Pittsburgh. He, uh, he's drafted. He goes off to fight in World War I. He's wounded at the Battle of Verdun in France. He's decorated. He comes back to Pittsburgh. He comes back to a Pittsburgh that is now in the depths not only of the Depression, but Prohibition. Right? So he decides he's going to buy an old beat-up car, and he's going to drive a cab. Okay. So a guy approaches him one day who's a representative of the Latrobe Brewery, which might sound familiar, right? Rolling Rock Beer. And a guy says to him, hey, listen, I need a driver. And, uh, and Gus Greenlee was just about to ask him where he was going. And I said, no, 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 not like that. I, I need to hire a driver for a full-time job. And Cumberland Posey, he said, well, I have a job. And he said, uh, how, uh, how much have you ever made in your best day? He said, lately? I don't know. Five bucks? And the guy says, all right, why don't you multiply that by 150? And Gus Greenlee said, when do I start? And he never worked another legal job in his life. Um, his entire life from that point on was running numbers, gambling, you name it. Um, but he was also a complicated guy. He was seen as a real Robin Hood figure in the hill section of Pittsburgh, the black section of Pittsburgh. Um, didn't get, you know, didn't make a big deal out of it, but um, it was just routine for people to know that if you had a doctor's bill you couldn't cover, if one of your kids was sick, there would be an envelope that would appear at your door. Uh, if you needed money for the mortgage, money to pay the rent, there would be an envelope at your door. On Christmas Day, everybody knew in the Hill District, you open up your door, and there would be a big wicker basket with a big hand dinner courtesy of Gus Greenlee, Merry Christmas. So he was beloved in the Hill section. And he opened up in the late 1920s, he opened up the Crawford Grill, which was a legendary jazz place. It was seen as a, a real melting pot. It was, it, was, it was really unique in that everybody, whites, blacks, you name it, felt comfortable at the Crawford Grill. Every jazz grade of the era that you can think of, you know, anybody you can think of, Basie, Billy Holiday, Ella Fitzgerald, uh, you know, Cap Calloway, they all played the Crawford Grill. And just like Composi, Gus Greenlee is approached around the same time about saving another baseball team in Pittsburgh that is also going to go under if nobody takes over. The Pittsburgh, I always blank on the name, but it was like some athletic club kind of name, right? So he says, I'll buy the club, and I'll even build my own ballpark, uh, but I'm going to change the name of the club to promote my grill. So the Pittsburgh Crawfords were born. So a year after Cumberland Posey won 143 games, Gus Greenlee's Pittsburgh Crawfords won almost 100 games against just 32 losses. Now they did this by signing some legendary ball, incredible black ball players. Here's Oscar Charles, one of the greatest shortstops to have ever played. But they did it more than anything by grabbing the two best players on Cumberland Posey's home state grays, a young pitcher named Satchel Page and a young catcher named Josh Gibson. Now, this is something that, uh, you know, two years later, both of these guys were back on Cumberland Posey's home state grades, and they would go back and forth several times. So would most of these players, because these two owners were all about poaching each other's players. All about it. They poached each other's players at the start of the season. They poached each other's players in the same week of a game. They poached each other's players in one celebrated instance during a game. <laughs> that must have been very confusing to that poor player. But you know, those two players I said there were two people that were not unsung heroes because, of course, they're very sung. Satchel Page, one of probably the three greatest pitchers to have ever played baseball, and certainly the most famous Negro leader of all time, and Josh Gibson, universally regarded, even during his playing days, as the Black Babe Ruth. Incredible slugger, catcher. You know, interesting, Josh Gibson met the real life Babe Ruth shortly before he died. Um, and Babe Ruth threw his big meaty arm around him as he was wont to do, and he shook him a little, which is what he usually did, and he said, Mr. Gibson, how about that? I understand, I call you the black Babe Ruth. And such a page said, tell you the truth, sir, my people call you the white Josh Gibson. <laughs> <laughs> so 
how do we know so much about the Negro Leagues? And share all these anecdotes about the Negro Leagues, stuff I never would have known had I not been able to research in detail the Negro Leagues. But how? How? White newspapers didn't cover the Negro Leagues. No books were written about the Negro Leagues at this time, in the 1930s. The entire history of the Negro Leagues, there was not one mainstream white newspaper, not one, not one, that ever had a white sports reporter as a, as a beat reporter following the Negro Leagues. Not one. The only time, the only time a white mainstream newspaper would, would write anything about the Negro Leagues was when they were playing a major league team. So like, for instance, in 1930, you know, in the early 1930s when Satchel Paige and, and the Black Yankees played the New York Yankees at Yankee Stadium and he struck out Joe DiMaggio three times, the only time in DiMaggio's entire life he ever struck out three times, the Times wrote all about it. That was the only time. So if the white press didn't cover the Negro Leagues, how do we know so much about them? The black press. The second most important unsung hero in breaking the color barrier. Because without the black press, the stories that raised people's consciousness all over the country, coast to coast, north and south, about learning about these incredible players like Josh Gibson and these incredible teams, like the Homestead Grays and the Pittsburgh Crawfords, even people in Pittsburgh, even whites. You know, the joke in Pittsburgh in the 1930s, you know, Pittsburgh was home to a major league team. The Pirates were awful in the 1930s. So the joke in Pittsburgh among blacks and whites was that Pittsburgh is home to two great baseball teams. The Pirates aren't one of them. Right? So how did we do it? The papers were critical in terms of raising people's consciousness all over the country that players of this caliber, teams of this caliber, we're playing right now, but they can't play Major League Baseball because of the color barrier, right? So how did that story, how did those stories get out, right? I mean, Robert Lee Van, owner and publisher of the Pittsburgh Courier, greatest black distribution, black newspaper of all time with the greatest distribution in history. It just barely in front of the Chicago Defender, the second greatest, Robert Sengstack, avid Chicago Defender. And they hire people like Wendell Smith and Sam Lacey. Wendell Smith will pop up at Fenway Park before we're done in a few minutes. These players wrote these stories about this team, and they were crusading journalists. There was none of this objectivity. There was about the game itself. There was about facts. But it was also a fact that they always made sure to wrap up their stories with that Josh Gibson just hit the longest home run ever hit in Yankee Stadium. Some say it went 500 feet. Either way, it went more than 450 feet, which would make it longer by 20 or 30 feet than anything Babe Ruth ever hit in his entire life. But he can't do that at Yankee Stadium on a regular basis for you, you, you New York Yankee fans because of the color barrier. So they were they were raising consciousness about the color barrier in a way that had never been possible before the growth of the black press. But how did they get these stories? How did they get these stories all over America? The Pittsburgh Courier could barely make deadline Monday through Friday. Same thing with the Chicago Defender. It was all they could do to get their papers out to every newsstand that carried it in Chicago or Pittsburgh. How are they getting their papers to Miami? Which they did. How are they getting the papers to Seattle, Washington, which they did? How? The single most unlikely unsung hero in the entire story. You could never see this coming. I was bowled over by the story of the Pullman Porters and how they played a critical role in breaking. Like, how did they play a role in breaking the color barrier in Major League Baseball? They're making people's beds on a train. They're keeping track of when people need a wake-up call. Which, of course, back then was a wake-up knock on your birth. How? What the hell did they have to do with Major League Baseball? <gasps> so those two newspaper publishers, right? Van of the, of the Pittsburgh Courier and Abbott of the Chicago Defender, they were very, very, very creative, imaginary guys. And they saw, they saw the unique position that the Pullman Porters occupied in the African-American community. They were unlike anyone else in the entire African community. Listen, at that time, they were unlike most Americans. Most Americans were not traveling all over the country. But they were. All over the country. Every single major city in the entire country, these guys were hidden. Hmm. 
these publishers thought, wow, what if we could get them to help deliver our newspaper? Now, they couldn't just do that out in broad daylight because they would have been fired on the spot. But they found an ingenious way that went like this. So let's say a train is going to pull out of South Station and it's going to head down the eastern seaboard to say it's going to end up in Miami. So the porters were also responsible for provisioning the train. So let's say they made contact with a black bakery in Mattapan. And the bakery truck arrives at South Station with the bread. And there are these big baskets, like, like five feet high, with the bread. Underneath the bread would be bundles of newspapers. The Black Reporter, the Black Chronicle, right? Train leaves, pulls in it, next stop, Penn Station, New York. Penn Station, they offload the black newspapers from Boston, they onload the Amsterdam News, the black newspaper from New York. They do the same thing in Baltimore with the Afro-American. They do the same thing in Washington, same thing in Chattanooga, all the way down to Miami, and they're doing this in every single run, in every single direction, all around the country. So that by 1939, you have this incredible thing. Great, great, great anecdote of this New York Times salesperson who's on vacation in San Francisco. And he finds copies, can't get the New York Times, but he finds copies of the Pittsburgh Courier, Chicago Defender. He said, how the hell are these newspapers ending up here? Pullman Porters. So now people all over the country, particularly in black communities, who are not only reading these wonderful stories about the now, for the first time, sort of three-dimensional stories of these incredible players like Josh Gibson and Satchel Paige, but they were also being reminded constantly that these players could be in the major leagues. You could go see Satchel Page. You could go see Satchel Page pitch in Chicago. If only he could play for the White Sox or the Cubs, but he can't. So now consciousness is rising. And it finally meets opportunity in 1940. Because in 1940, America is about to just like with the Depression a decade earlier, is about to have a cataclysmic event, World War II. And in New York, Lester Rodney, which is perfect to follow the Pullman Porters because he is just, an unlike, just as much an unlikely, improbable ally in the draft to break the color barrier as the Pullman Porters, more so. He's white, he's Jewish, he's a communist. Hey, nobody's perfect. <laughs> but he was also a gifted sports writer. And he would have written for anybody. But in, in the late 1930s, the American Communist Party starts a sports section in his newspaper, The Daily Worker. So they need somebody to write about sports. So Lester Rodney took the job. Lester Rodney took the job. And he was a, he was a man at the right time because America is going to war. And Lester Rodney loves baseball. And he hates the color barrier. And he frames the argument to break the color barrier in a way that nobody has framed it before. Which is, as he would constantly write, America is going to war. Blacks as well as whites are being trained to fight. Blacks as well as whites will go overseas and fight. Blacks as well as whites will come home in boxes. And those who don't come home in boxes, but who play baseball, will have just been asked to have, if necessary, sacrifice their life for their country and go back to a country that won't let them play baseball, sit where they want on a bus, or sit at a lunch counter. And now for the first time, it happens. It wasn't you know, just baseball. Since, since then, you, know, you see in other landmark changes of the public attitude about an issue. Sometimes it's just the events and the time, and it's pivotal, and it's pivotal. Right? It's happened with, with, with gay marriage, it's happened with marijuana, right? This was a pivot point for the color barrier. People just began to see that as just, that's just not right. It's just not fair, right? And the Pittsburgh Courier framed it in a different way. For black servicemen who wrestled with that, they're the ones, after all, who are being asked that if it's necessary, sacrifice your life for your country and come back to a country that makes you a second-class citizen. And the couriers started a campaign that helped rationalize for these, for these soldiers. Helped rationalize it. They called it the Double V campaign. Double victory. Go overseas, 
defeat Adolf Hitler, come home, defeat Jim Crow. It was the double victory campaign. That handkerchief was worn by all the flyers of the Tuskegee Airmen. But the Tuskegee Airmen, you know, that, they're the celebrity all-black unit in some ways. There were flyers, it was, you know, it's understood. But it's actually a different all-black unit that has a direct impact on breaking the color barrier now in just under five years. The 761st was the first all-black armored unit in history. They fought for Patton's Third Army. They set records for consecutive days at the front. They were one of the first units to cross over into Germany. They were one of the first units to liberate a death camp, Buchenwald. But more importantly for our story, they also had a young lieutenant named Jack Roosevelt Robinson. Jackie Robinson got his lieutenant stripes at Fort Riley in Kansas, and he was transferred to Fort Hood in Texas to help take charge of the 761st. And he could not wait to get to Europe and to lead the 761st in combat. Didn't get there. Just before, just before, days before the 761st was to disembark for Fort Dix in New Jersey and final disembarkation to Europe, Jackie Robinson flunks his final physical. An old football injury was discovered. He had been an All-American at UCLA. They found a hairline fracture in his knee, and he was not cleared for combat. He made a desperate request to still go with his unit to Europe as a special morale officer. It was denied. And Jackie Robinson said later it was the most crushing disappointment of his life to that point. Unit leaves. Jackie Robinson leaves the, the hospital, decides to get on the bus in Fort Hood and go to the Black uh, Officers Club and get a drink. And he takes a seat directly behind the bus driver in the front, front row of the bus. Not to make trouble. He hoped it wouldn't cause trouble. He had good reason to think it shouldn't cause trouble. Because 48 hours earlier, Jackie Robinson knew, the bus driver likely did not know, that President Roosevelt had signed an executive order prohibiting segregation on transportation inside US military bases. So Robinson knew he could sit wherever he wanted. The bus driver didn't. And the bus driver, as more whites got on the bus, the bus driver told Jackie Robinson to get to the back of the bus. Jackie Robinson said, nothing doing. The bus driver pulled over to an MP station. Jackie Robinson was let off the bus in handcuffs, arrested, court-martial, insubordination. How many of you know that Jackie Robinson was court-martial? No. No. In fact, you wouldn't really know who Jackie Robinson was if he had not beaten the court-martial rap, because he never would have been chosen by Brad Rickey with a dishonorable discharge to have broken the color barrier. But he beat the court martial. That's the good news. The bad news is that he was now out of a job. He was out of a job. He traded one uniform for another, though. Someone told him that, look, you can't play football anymore, but you can play baseball. You're a good ball player. J.O. Wilkinson, this guy told him, and owner of the Kansas City Monarchs is hiring for the 1945 season. Some of his best players aren't back from the war yet. So Jackie Robinson wrote a letter to J.L. Wilkinson, who signed him to the Kansas City Monarchs. And in spring 1945, Jackie Robinson broke camp with the Kansas City Monarchs in April 1945. How many of you know that in less than three weeks from starting the season with the Monarchs, Jackie Robinson will be at Fenway Park? Wow. Yeah. So at the same time Jackie Robinson is breaking camp with the Monarchs, Isidore H. Y. Muchnick is hard at work in Boston trying to clear the way for, he doesn't know Jackie Robinson, but he does want to find a way to force Major League Baseball teams to hire black ball players. And he's been trying for some time to no avail. Izzy Muchnick, fascinating character, sad in some ways, but a fascinating character. Izzy Muchnick was the second Jewish city councilor in Boston's history. He would become the first Jewish chairman of the Boston School Committee. He lived by, he was a devout Jew, and he lived by something in Judaism that is called tikkun olam. It translates from the Hebrew literally as repair the world. And it is something that Jews are called upon to do in their lives, however you can. It doesn't have to be big. If you offer a kind word to someone who is in desperate need of a kind word, you are repairing their world. But Izzy Machinik had his eyes on something bigger, breaking the color barrier. But how? He was, a, he was a gifted lawyer, Harvard Law School, Harvard College. Could have worked for any of the, you know, at that time, what they used to call the white shoe Boston law firms, you know, Hale and Dorr, Palmer and Dodge, or Peabody, or whoever I get those names. They all seem to go together. But he wouldn't change his name. 
So he opened up his own law firm, worked on the city council, worked on defending injured clients, and in his spare time at home, poured through the bylaws of Boston to find something that might be leveraged, might compel a team like the Red Sox to at least try out a black ball player. But what? And then one night, he found it. You remember the Blue Laws. Mm -hmm. Well, in 1945, a Blue Law that still existed stipulated that a Boston sports team could not play baseball on Sunday without the unanimous vote of the Boston City Council. And the vote had to be given annually at the start of the season. As he much suddenly knew, he had leverage. He had, all he had to do was withhold his vote. So he wrote a letter to the brain trust of the Boston Red Sox, and he informed general manager Eddie Collins, right here, also a former Hall of Fame second baseman of the Chicago White Sox, he informed Eddie Collins that, um, well, actually, he, he put it in the form of a request. He said, Mr. Collins, I'm sure you share, he didn't, but he said, I'm sure you share my interest in one day integrating Major League Baseball, and I am asking you to take some concrete steps to at least trying out some qualified black ball players. And Eddie Collins, kind of charming Southern guy, um, he didn't know who he was dealing with. Izzy Munchen was a bulldog, played goal for Harvard's hockey team. He was not going to be put off. But his, Eddie Collins thought he could put him off. So he said, oh, Mr. Muchnick, my esteemed Mr. Muchnick, it might interest you to know. Do you know, for instance, he said, in my entire tenure with the Boston Red Sox, not a single black individual has ever inquired about employment here. And by the way, please find your closest tickets to the next Red Sox game. <laughs> Izzy Muchnick was not going to be put off, and he wasn't. And with a courtroom lawyer's exquisite sense of timing, he waited. And he waited. And then about a week before the city council was to take up the vote on the annual clearing of the, the Red Sox to play baseball on Sunday, he sent another cable to Eddie Collins. And he said, Mr. Collins, it appears to me you are not serious about taking any concrete steps to offer employment to any black ball players. Therefore, this letter will serve to let you know I will be withholding my vote to let the Red Sox play on Sunday this season. And I don't know how long it took Eddie Collins to read that note and appear in Tom Yawkey's office, but I have a feeling it was under five minutes. And on the same day, Izzy Munchner got a return cable, the Red Sox will offer a trial to three. Three qualified black ball players. There is to be no press of any kind. Please have the players appear at KD at Fenway Park on August 12th, 1945 at 11 a.m. Yours truly, Eddie Collins. Well, Izzy Munchner knew a lot about Boston ordinances. He did not know about personnel in the Negro Leagues. So he contacted Wendell Smith. Wendell Smith of the Pittsburgh Courier, and he asked him for help in finding three qualified black ball players, and Wendell Smith came up with three players. Marvin Williams, Sam Jethro, and a kid named Jackie Robinson. Just starting his first season with the Kansas City Monarchs. And they trooped to Boston, and they were all ready, it was a Sunday, and they were all ready for their trial. But the next day, August 12, 1945, Franklin Roosevelt died. And America was plunged into mourning, and the trial obviously was canceled. 24 hours later, America began to open up again. The trial was still off. 48 hours later, America was completely back at work. But the Red Sox, curiously, were still apparently deep, deep in mourning. What they really wanted to do was try to run out the clock. They wanted to get just two more days. Two more days, because if they could get to April 16th, they were due to take a train out of Back Bay Station at 1 o'clock in the afternoon to New York, where they would open up against the Yankees, the 1945 season, the next day on the 17th. And it almost worked. But in the morning of April 16th, 1945, a white sports writer, Dave Egan, of the Boston Hack Traveler, broke the story. And it was front page news. He wrote it in the form of a letter to Boston's baseball fans. And he said, dear baseball fan, you should know that at this hour, as they have been for the past week, there are three Negro baseball players marooned in a hotel room in Boston. They have been promised a tryout by your Boston Red Sox, who are now trying to run out the clock, skip town, and renege on their promise. And the Red Sox realized they got to have a tryout. 
So they cabled quickly Izzy Muchnik. They said, get the players over here. He did. They trooped onto the field. They suited up. They trooped onto the field about 11 o'clock in the morning. They ran the bases. They took some infield, took some batting practice. About 45 minutes later, they were called off the field. They were thanked very much. They were told the Red Sox will be in touch. The Red Sox never contacted any of those players ever again. But one play, one guy was watching and hearing reports of that tryout for the last five days, never mind that morning. And he must he was he was horrified. Brentford, general manager of the Brooklyn Dodgers. He was horrified. Because at the same time the Red Sox are trying out these three black ball players, Branch Rickey has already been preparing for eight months to sign Jackie Robinson to the Dodgers and break the color barrier. So he's horrified that he hated Jockey, as he put it, leave it to that son of a bitch Jockey to sign Robinson next time. But, but we could have told Branch Rickey that he had nothing to worry about. Because it was going to take Tom Yorkey another 12 years to sign the first black ball player of the Boston Red Sox. But Ricky did sign him. Only six months later, in October 1945, he signed Jackie Robinson. He broke the color barrier, and of course, the rest is history. Wearing number 42, as he strode out onto the field, he took his position at first base amid the din of cheering fans and of broadcasters announcing history of exploding flashbulbs capturing it. There were also two inaudible sounds at Evans Field that day, of a wall falling and of cheering that could not be heard with the ear, only with the heart. It rose from those not present physically, but spiritually. Those who could not be seen, but were there just the same. Moses Fleetwood Walker didn't live to see it. And by the time he died, broken, bitter, alcoholic, he couldn't even imagine it. But he was there. Bud Fowler, Bud Fowler, who tried his entire life to outrun the shadow of the wall that rose up to deny him at the end in every turn. In life, it seemed that he and his scuffed bat and well-worn mitt had been everywhere, anywhere he could hook onto a team. A black man desperately just trying to play baseball as long as he possibly could. Now, he was in Brooklyn. Even as they worked their regular shifts that historic day, some rolling along the rails within just a mile of Ebbets Field on their way west or south, the Pullman Porters, who had ensured that those stories of people like Wendell Smith and Sam Lacey reached readers all over America, they were there. The Negro leaders, past and present, those who would come too early and those who were young enough to imagine that they might now too walk through the door, they were there. And the African American veterans, of the war just ended. And those who had given their lives in it, they were there. On this momentous day, a ball game was played before a crowd both present and cheering, and another crowd silent and unseen. They watched the game, and they watched the terrible right being finally overtaken the wrong. To be sure, even as a black ball player bounded onto an otherwise all-white field, racism was still alive in Brooklyn and clear on across America. So many other barriers remained in place. And he still are. But on this day, some of the hurt and the humiliation were sound. On this day, hope and faith that had long seemed to have run out were finally redeemed. On this day, the long arc of the moral universe seemed to bend improbably toward Brooklyn, touching down on the grass and the dirt of a creaky old ballpark where the familiar white lines would no longer bar a black ball player. And in the bottom of the seventh inning, when Jackie Robinson laid down a perfect bunt and raced toward first base, he was not alone. That invisible crowd was suddenly right there, running right alongside, willing him on. And as Robinson sprinted safely onto second base and caught his breath, they had sailed with him. After all, it had been a long, uncertain journey, and they had helped him get there. The next Dodger batter doubled. Jackie Robinson rounded third, and he was home. And so on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm happy to. Uh, I'm happy to answer a question too. If anybody has a question or two, um, I'm happy to answer one. That's a, it's it's just so my Yes, sir. <laughs> um, firestorming, is that a baseball term or is it an airplane term? <laughs>
It's used by both. Yeah, it is. I think originally a barnstormer was the airplane. Uh, and then baseball, I think, took it on because it was that sense of like dropping into a town and playing a quick game and being on your way. And that's what the early barnstorming pilots and the mail planes did. Yeah, yeah I know they they found their way. The early pilots found their way from the smoke, from the chimneys of the cities. That's, ah, how, that's how they knew the direction. To oh, go. so that's a, I didn't know that. Yeah. So you know you were flying, you know, with, with the, the winds going east and. So well, you knew, it is, you, you know, come, you know, you had some direction. Right. If you were coming right. from Ohio to Pittsburgh, you, yeah. could fall, you could find a way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So yeah, learn something all the time. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. How old was uh, Satchel Page? Was, was it the Indians? The first team he played for? So uh, when Satchel Page got to the major leagues, it was the St. Louis Browns first, and then the Indians, and then the Indians. Same owner, Bill Vack who was himself a very progressive owner. As a wreck. Very. Bill Veck was, what a fascinating, fascinating character. Um, my own Bill Veck story, um, I was in Chicago one summer in the 80s, and at that point, Bill Veck had also been the owner of the Chicago White Sox at one point. And, you know, he was kind of a rogue kind of guy. He was a heavy drinker and smoker. He lost a, he, he lost a leg to diabetes, right? So I was in, a friend of mine, and we were in, we were in, the, um, in the bleachers, right? And I'm looking, and said, there's this guy, and a lot of people like waving at him, and I'm thinking, quick, because he was like, he's drinking a beer, he's smoking a big stogie, he's got a t-shirt on, then he took his t-shirt off, he's wearing no shirt. And as I looked, I was like, the guy's getting his prosthetic leg on the seat next to him. Go back. <laughs> <laughs> Like, and at some point, he was like, Sando, you suck! He was like, <laughs> <laughs> Former major league owner. No wonder the owners, the other owners didn't like Bill Beck. Um, <laughs> not, a, what, not a suit and tie kind of guy. But he did. He signed, he signed Satchel Page to the, to, the, to, the, um, to the Browns, and then he signed it to the Indians. And Satchel Page was a, a force in the 1954 World Series with the Indians. And Satchel Page would eventually play his last major league game there's a trivia question. Who do you think he played his last game against? They always pop up in history. They, they, Red Sox. The Red Sox always pop up in it. They're like the zealot of baseball teams, right? They always pop up in some weird connection. Yes. So in 1965, six? God, Satchel Baker's 50, almost 55. And uh, Charlie Finley, who was the you know sort of crazy promotion mad owner of then the Kansas City Athletics, which he would then move them to Oakland, he did a great thing. He was so Satchel Page was just shy of the games he needed. Uh, I think he was one game short of getting a baseball pension, and Charlie Finley gave him a one game contract, and he was 55 years old. And uh, and he, he played against the Red Sox. The Red Sox played the yeah. Kansas City. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone else? Yes. Yeah. What uh, 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 Negro League years? What was the audience comprised of? Was it a good question? Game? Was it all black? You mean? Or were there... Or yeah. Right. So it starts out. Thanks for coming. It starts out almost entirely black. Right. Over time. Over time. It began to be sometimes half and half. Sometimes, depending on, on who was pitching, if Satchel Page was pitching, you might have more whites at the game than blacks. So it really changed. And that was what also made the change in terms of breaking the color barrier. Because as more and more whites saw how good these players were, you know, it was it, it wasn't always even in terms of like, you know, it's the it's the moral thing to do. It was the fact that, you know, somebody would see Satchel Page, if you were a Yankees fan, and you saw Satchel Page strike out Joe DiMaggio three times, you turned to your friend, you know, and you said, why can't we get Satchel Page to play for the Yankees? Oh, right, that's why. Mm. That's, that's why it was important. That's why it was important. But yes, it grew over time. And it depended what city you were in, too. It depended what city you were in. Anyone else? So, again, Double thank you, right? Thank you for coming to hear me talk, but thank you also for making the effort to come 
to an in-person talk at the library because I, I know I don't have to speak for Shannon that libraries, you know, they, hopefully, even if there's a hiccup coming up, hopefully we're going in the right direction. And, uh, you know, public libraries don't function well as virtual things. They are the centers of community. They are third places in American life where communities gather, and you've got to do that in person. There's no, there's no way to do that via Zoom. So uh, thanks for coming out and showing that support tonight. I really appreciate it. And uh, as you leave, I, I'm going to be over here in this corner. If you'd like to purchase a book, I have my other books, but I have before Brooklyn. If anybody would like to purchase a book, I would be happy to sign one for you. Uh, whether you sign a book or not, over on that little side of that big, big square table, uh, I have a sign-up list for my mailing list. If you'd like to get on my mailing list, all you got to do is give me an email address. And with that, again, thank you very, very much, folks. Thank you. Thank you.